My goodness, truly the Holy Spirit is in our midst this morning. Amen and praise God. There's been another high school mass shooting. Another eight students and two teachers killed and 13 others wounded. It is the 22nd school shooting this year alone. From Columbine to Virginia Tech to Sandy Hook to Parkland High to this latest atrocity, a series of massacres responded to by a series of non-actions. The names of Sabatha, Chris, Angelica, Kimberly, Shana, Christian, Aaron, Anne, Jared, and Cynthia have now been added to the growing list of those whose lives have been sacrificed on the altar of a false god. For 11 years, I have wept, prayed, preached, written, witnessed, advocated, and called for our society to do something about this terrible cancer. Yet every opportunity has been lost, every effort aborted, every plan thwarted, all in the service of the human-made golden idol of the Second Amendment. Perhaps now is the time for God to raise up prophets, prophets like the Hebrew ones of old, to speak God's words to all people. Enough 
is too much. No more excuses. No more distractions. No more empty rhetoric. No more halfway measures. No more broken promises. Maybe it is time for God to raise up prophets who will proclaim that God demands, doesn't ask, but demands nothing less that we do whatever it will take to stop the murder of God's innocent children. The details God may lead, leave us to decide, but God's message through those prophets will be clear. Do whatever is necessary to stop gun violence in this country and do it now. Amen. from Ezekiel, I can say it is one of my favorites, and it can preach. Now, it's actually not the subject of the sermon today, but listen to it and let the words of it just come into your heart and soul because it is powerful and wonderful. And then we will hear the traditional story <laughs> from Acts 2, the Pentecost story. And once again, we will engage with a story that both inspires and challenges us in new ways. But to prepare our hearts for the hearing of this word, let us join together in prayer. Holy Spirit, come and be among us. Long, long ago, you inspired, astonished, and confuse the people. Come to us now to fill our ears with the sound of your breath. Fill our eyes with the brilliance of your presence, which we behold in one another. And fill our hearts with your good word. Amen. Good morning. I'll be reading from Ezekiel 37, 1 through 14. Valley of Dry Bones. The Lord's power overcame me, and while I was in the Lord's spirit, he led me out and set me down in the middle of a certain valley. It was full of bones. God led me through them all around, and I saw that there were a great many of them on the valley floor, and they were very dry. God asked me, human one, can these bones live again? I said, Lord God, only you know. God said to me, prophecy over these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the Lord's word. The Lord God proclaims to the, these bones, I'm about to put breath in you and you will live again. I will put sinews on you, place flesh on you and cover you with skin. When I breathe in you and you come to life, you will know that I am the Lord. I prophesied just as I was commanded. There was a great noise as I was prophesying, then a great quaking, and the bones came together, bone by bone. When I looked, suddenly there were sinews on them. The flesh appeared, and then they were covered over with skin, but there was still no breath in them. The Lord said to me, prophecy to the breath, prophecy, human one, say to the breath, the Lord God proclaims, come from the four winds, breathe, breathe into these dead bodies and let them live. I prophesy, prophesy just as God commanded me. When the breath entered them, they came to life and stood on their feet, an extraordinarily large company. God said to me, I will put my breath in you and you will live. I will plant you on your fertile land, and you will know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it. This is what the Lord says. And now we're reading from Acts 2, verses 1 through 21. When the Feast of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. 
Without warning, there was a sound like a strong wind, gale force. No one could tell where the wind came from. It filled the whole building. Then, like a wildfire, the Holy Spirit spread through their ranks. They saw what seemed to be individual flames of fire alighting on each one of them. And they started speaking in different languages as the Spirit prompted them. There were many religious people from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. When they heard the sound, they came on the run. And when they heard their own languages being spoken, they were thunderstruck. They couldn't for the life of them figure out what was going on. And they kept saying, aren't these all Galileans? How come we're hearing them talk in our own languages? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, visitors from Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, immigrants from Rome, fellow Jews and those new to the faith, even Cretans and Arabs, they're speaking our languages and describing God's mighty works. Their heads were spinning. They couldn't make head or tail of any of it. They talked back and forth, completely bewildered, saying, What is going on here? But others joked, Oh, they're just drunk on cheap wine, probably four buck chuck. <laughs> That's when Peter stood up and, backed by the other 11, spoke out with bold urgency. Friends and all of you who are visiting Jerusalem, Listen carefully and get this story straight. These people aren't drunk, as some of you suspect. They haven't had time to get drunk. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. No, listen. This is what the prophet Joel announced would happen. In the last days, God said, I will give my spirit to everyone. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young women and men will see visions. Your old women and men will dream dreams. When the time comes, I'll pour out my spirit on everyone who serves me, men and women both, and they will prophesy in my name. May we pause for a word of prayer. O Holy One, we thank you for the power of the word we have heard. May your Holy Spirit come upon each one of us and fill us with your peace. Fill us with your joy. Fill us with your love and bring to us new visions. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, you who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So on that day, they were all gathered in one place. Yes, they were all gathered in one place, and they knew what to expect. They had done it on a number of occasions. And then, as they were gathered, as they were gathered, suddenly, a wind, kind of like the nor'easters we've had this winter, right? And they're still coming. Summer is on the way. A wind like a big nor'easter awakened them awaken them to a new understanding, a new understanding about love, a unifying love, a breaking down the barriers, love, a building of bridges, love, a new love. And you thought I was talking about the Pentecost story, didn't you? What about the royal wedding yesterday? <laughs> OK? You see, this is how I was going to begin the sermon before yesterday morning, in the wee hours when many of us were awake to watch that magnificent event. I was going to say, 
You know that royal wedding? How many of you saw the royal wedding? You can still can put up your hands. Yes, okay. A lot of us. The royal wedding, it was wonderful, but it was choreographed. Everyone knew what was going to happen. The expectations were clear. In fact, there were no expectations that anything would happen out of the ordinary. It was going to be lovely, but certainly it would have no impact on the wider global stage. We got it wrong, didn't we? <laughs> Yesterday's royal wedding was evidence as there never, I think, has been before that Pentecost is real. It was a Pentecost moment because a spirit was unleashed that we could never have imagined. And it was unleashed in the words of the most Reverend Michael Curry, the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church of the USA. I was joking with our colleagues Wesley and Ken yesterday that I bet attendance at Episcopal churches is going to be way up today. <laughs> there was evangelism going on, but it wasn't just evangelism for the church, it was evangelism for a way of being in the world that we have been seeking for centuries. And there it was on the global stage. But you see, it wasn't expected. The same way it was on that first Pentecost 2,000 years ago. They were all gathered, and why were they gathered? Well, they were gathered for the Jewish festival called Shavuot, a festival that takes place 50 days after Passover. That festival is a harvest festival. It also, in later Jewish tradition, became a festival to commemorate the giving of the Torah to Moses. They knew exactly what to expect. They had come to this festival every year. It was part of their so-called liturgical calendar. Nothing was going to happen that was different. But then, the rush of that nor'easter wind, and all of a sudden, people are speaking in different ways. Now, can you imagine, can you imagine, if this had happened in the time of smartphones, and Twitter, and Facebook, texting and email, believe me, the word would have gotten out really fast, right? You can just see them there texting and twittering away. But the word went out, but maybe not as far as we had hoped it could, but it did go out because they started speaking in different languages. You know what I think was really more miraculous? They started understanding each other. They started hearing each other. They started to understand and hear the stories and the perspectives that each person brought. That's pretty astonishing, isn't it? And isn't that essentially what Archbishop um, Curry said yesterday? That the power of love, when it is unleashed, takes down divisions. When we listen to each other, when we hear each other, and the stories and perspectives that we bring, when we hear and listen to those in the world who don't often get heard, whose voices are silenced, and we say, yes, God is present in the hearing of that word, divisions fall and a beloved community is created. And so on this Pentecost, they came in with no expectations and look what happened. Now, 
Here's a fun fact about the Bible. The stories that are most important to our faith, in particular our faith, as those who follow Jesus, Christmas, Easter, and Pentecost, are absolutely the least credible. Isn't that the most amazing thing? <laughs> they are absolutely the least credible. Because let's face it, the details are not terribly believable. So because of that, what happens really at Christmas and Easter and Pentecost. We love to celebrate them, don't we? We're all wearing red today, or at least many of us are. And of course, in Christmas, yes. But we know what our Christmas traditions and routines are. In truth, none of us approach Christmas with the expectation that something extraordinary that will happen that will change us. Quite to the contrary, once we get through Christmas, we get back to our routines. In fact, we often look forward to it. Same thing for Easter, right? You know, yeah, we, we talk about the resurrection, but really it's more about being on the beach, more about the chocolate, more about having brunch, right? We, do, we have our routines around Easter, and we don't really expect that engaging with the risen Christ is going to change us. We don't have that expectation, so we just look forward to going on as usual. Now, Pentecost is not as big, obviously as Christmas and Easter. There are no cards, I'm fairly certain, in the Hallmark shop that are Pentecost cards. Now, wouldn't that be extraordinary if they were? We could start a movement of Pentecost greeting cards and just say, come Holy Spirit into my life in a new way. Holy Spirit, I'm sending it to you. But when we come on Pentecost Sunday, yes, we love to hear the story, at least I hope some of you love to hear the story. It's not the usual story. And we love the music. Think of the choir and the bells today. We have been filled. But really, what is the expectation that anything in your lives is really going to change once we leave this sanctuary and feast on hamburgers and hot dogs and all sorts of wonderful things at our barbecue? Really, what is the expectation? Most of us don't come in to worship generally with the expectation that God is going to be present in a way that is going to change our lives. The Pentecost story tells us that it is possible that God does break in in extraordinary ways, in ways that can change the world. And it happened yesterday when Michael Curry spoke of the power, the power of love. It's the power of possibilities. The possibilities for your life. I mean, think about it. The power of love. Let's add some words to it. And it's unclear whether this is a phrase actually from Jimi Hendrix or from a, um, one of the prime ministers of England back in the 1800s. When the power of love is greater than the love of power, there is peace. When the power of love is greater than the love of power, there is peace. Think about your own lives. When the power of love is greater than the love of power in your relationships, in your working life, when you're on a committee, we all know about that. Barriers. Barriers come down. Bridges are built. The, we become beloved community in our families, in our working lives, in church. But you see, we sometimes don't think that there really are possibilities for our lives. You know, especially as we get older. Oh. You know, I've retired from that, right? 
Sometimes they feel, I've retired from faith. Or more than that, God has retired from me or I've retired from God. There's just no room in my life to let God do something new and help me be a vehicle for being the power of love in the world. Well, the thing of it is, is that even unto the last breath that we all take and beyond to the breaths we take in God's eternal heavenly realm, we are never, ever outside of the hold of God, never outside of God's arms. And so the possibility for something new in your life is always there and then continues on eternally. Isn't that an extraordinary truth? And it must be because if it wasn't, how could it not be that the Pentecost story continues to recreate itself over and over again in history like it did yesterday? So individually and in our community lives, the power of love, the power of God, is greater than the love of power and enables us to be those who build those bridges. You know, the New Testament scholar N.T. Wright has a quote in one of his books from C.S. Lewis. And the quote is this. Now, C.S. Lewis was a good Christian, and so he took Christian sacraments very seriously. And what he said is, outside of the bread and cup of communion, the most sacred thing in your lives, the most sacred thing in your lives is a neighbor because it is in the neighbor that you truly see the presence of God. And that means every neighbor even the neighbors you don't like, and maybe even the neighbors whose stories you don't understand. Yesterday at the royal wedding, we saw, we witnessed a coming together of cultures, of languages, of traditions. We witnessed a challenge to hierarchies and social class that divide us. And you know everybody listened. And what was so fascinating about this Pentecost moment, and somehow I do not think it is a coincidence that this royal wedding happened on Pentecost weekend. Somehow God took this moment and transformed it into a global event. The response to that sermon went worldwide. And it went beyond the boundaries of particular tradition. And the joy, the excitement that in those 13 minutes a word was preached that suggested that the beloved community of God not only is possible, but could be probable and could be on the way, actually transform people and I think gave abundant hope. And that is what Pentecost does. It gives us hope that God's beloved community is possible, probable, real, and that we all can have a part in it. So. What are your expectations for Pentecost? When you leave here, is it going to be same old, same old, back to your lives? Or are things going to be different? Are you going to open your hearts to the Holy Spirit? Don't be afraid of the Holy Spirit. You saw it yesterday, actually. Holy Spirit works. Open your hearts to the Holy Spirit so that something will change in your life that reveals love in a new way. And so that something will change here in the church that pushes those walls even further and further out and builds stronger and stronger bridges amongst all of God's people.
And that is present in our community and in our nation because you know what, I'm going to follow up on Russ's words. When the power of love is greater than the love of power, we're not going to have any more gun violence. So yes, we do have work to do. But from what we heard yesterday, I think that work is possible. And if we deny that expectation, then we are saying that Pentecost doesn't matter. Pentecost matters. May the Holy Spirit be in your lives in new and bold ways. And let us all create that beloved community of God where everyone, everyone, everyone is loved and blessed. Amen.
that the refrain of every time I feel the spirit is every time I feel the spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Well, you know what they did on Pentecost? When they were speaking in different languages, the story tells us they were praising God. They were telling of God's mighty works. So if we're going to sing this hymn today, we just don't want to pray. We want to praise. So how about this? Every time I feel the spirit moving in my heart, I will praise. Did you hear that? I will praise, OK? That's number one. So that's the refrain, I will praise. Here's something else about the refrain. Listen to the words. Every, every time I feel the spirit moving in my heart. Well, you cannot sing moving in my heart if your body isn't moving too. Now maybe you're clapping, maybe Jen and Becky or I are going to be dancing. By the way, we did not rehearse this, so it'll be totally spirit filled. So I want the spirit to move within you, in your body, mind, and spirit. Now here's another thing. You don't have to sing the verses. That's why I want you to put the hymnals down. The choir will sing them. If you want to sing along with them, great. But you don't have to. It's the refrain. Every time I feel the spirit moving in my heart, I will praise. to the world because God has created new possibilities, new probabilities for your life. Open your hearts to God's presence. In the name of our God who is our creator, our God who comes to us in Jesus Christ, and our God who fills us with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.